My name is Toby. I am one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship Eastside. And uh, the cool thing about us is that our purpose, our mission, is to multiply disciples to the glory of God. And um, whether we come here or you're at small group or wherever we go, we want to pursue Christ, we want to share good news, and we want to live connected. And uh, the beauty of the church is that's exactly what God wants us to do. And so as, as, as you're here, hey, thank you so much for being here. If you're new to Christ Fellowship, there's a connect card either up under your seat or they're on that back table back there. And um, our elders, we get together and pray every Monday morning, and uh, we meet and hang out and seek the Lord. And if you have certain prayer requests that you want to put on that card and share with us, we'd love to be able to pray on your behalf. But you got to let us know, all right? So if you, you get the card, you can give it to one of the pastors. You can put it in the uh, offering box that's back there at the back table. And uh, we'd love to be able to spend some time praying for you. Today, we got a special guest with us. This is uh, Michael Seismat. He's a friend of ours from Cherrydale. He's going to share a little bit uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in the service about some cool, really neat things going on in his life. And um, I, I'm amazed, and I can't wait for you guys to hear this. So here we were talking the other week, and I, I called Brent and said, hey, can we have a sub one Sunday coming up so this guy can come and, and sing? And Brent, thanks for allowing that to happen. It's just really cool. And uh, he's going to share about a little bit about a mission opportunity that he's taken he and his family on for like forever. I don't know if it'll be forever, but it'll be, it's like living as a missionary somewhere else. It's really sweet. And so uh, as we meet, he's, he's going to lead us today, and then there's going to be a time where we're going to break, and he's going to share his story uh, of that. So I want to encourage you to pray for Michael and his sweet family as, uh, as, they leave, as they're leaving for missions. But as we, uh, as we continue in our service, let's pray. Let's, uh, let's seek the Lord. Um, so join with me as we, as we pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness and your uh, goodness. God, thank you for your forgiveness. And uh, we, we love you. And we thank you for being here today with us. And we pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. And God, I know a group this size, there's probably a lot of uh, stuff we may have brought into this room today. But God, I pray that through your spirit that you would roam around, you would convict of sin. You'd allow us to see you and trust you and know that you're in our presence. Thank you again for uh, allowing us to be here to meet uh, today. Pray as we sing that we glorify and praise you as we hear your word preached, that it would cut us deeply and we'd leave changed. And we'd, we'd understand that the gospel really does go with us everywhere we go. God, I pray that you'd interrupt our week this week so we can share the good news of Jesus with somebody that needs it desperately like we need it today. So God, as we sing, be glorified. As we talk to new people, be glorified. Everything that we do today, God, I pray that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Awesome. Well, good morning. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for letting me uh, lead you in worship this morning. If you would stand with us as we sing uh, this song. Sing when all I see is a battle, you see the victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. So when we fight, we fight on our knees. So when I fight, fight on my knees with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet as I see through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For 
For Jesus is nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, as you see the beauty, yes you do. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet and I see through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. As you shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Just sing it to him. And Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows as you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, and you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows as you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear. I Lay at your feet, and I see through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And oh God, the battle belongs to you. This morning I want to teach you a, a new song. It's called All Praise. Um, it's by Passion. It's been done at the Passion Conference, but. Uh, if you've ever listened to the music, you've probably heard it before, but one of the things I love about this song is it's just surrendering our lives, just surrendering everything that we are, just surrendering all of our circumstances, that no matter what is going on, God is to be the glory. He gets all of our praise in the highs and the lows, and I know if you're like me, I love to praise Him when things are going good, and sometimes I find myself struggling to lift those praises up when I'm kind of at that bottom spot. And so this song talks about that. These words talk about that. It's talking about in our world that we're in today, there's so much fighting going on that we're, we're not loving as much. But if he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and he has conquered death and he has overcome, then our whole life should reflect a lifestyle of worship and a lifestyle of praise. So I want to teach this to you this morning if you've never heard it before. But the chorus is just simple. It goes, all praise, all praise. Heaven been to meet us, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let's sing it out. It goes like this. It's all praise, all praise. It's heaven been to meet us, Father, Son, and Spirit. All praise, all praise. God and men together, one with us forevermore. Every breath it is a gift, every moment is a treasure. All my past and my regrets. My present and my future. It's 
Every table is a feast, every heartbeat is an altar. So we lay it down. Every step a mystery, but I'm walking with the author. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. I fix my eyes upon you. I fix my eyes upon you. Oh, we fix our eyes on you, Jesus. I fix my eyes upon you. I fix my eyes, saying, Oh, praise, oh, praise. And heaven bent to meet us, Father, Son, and Spirit, oh, So let all our fighting cease, for the Prince of Peace has conquered. Yes, you have. I fix my eyes upon you. I fix my eyes upon you. Oh, and I fix my eyes upon you. I fix my eyes, saying, Oh, pray. He's all the praise. Heaven bent to meet us, Father, Son, and Spirit. All praise, all praise. And God and man together, one with us forevermore. Downcast all my soul, you are in every moment, you are my greatest miracle. Wash my heart, weary. don't be so downcast, all my soul. You are in every moment, you are my greatest miracle. And wash my heart, weary. And don't be so downcast, all my soul. You are in every moment, you are my greatest miracle. And wash in my heart, grow weary, and don't be so downcast, oh my soul. You are in every moment, you are my greatest miracle. Yes, you are saying, oh. to meet us by the sun and spirit all praise all praise and God and man together one with us forever and all praise all praise and heaven bent to meet us by the sun and spirit That's our prayer this morning. God, that we would give you all the praise. God, for you are king. God, I pray that we would take this time of worship, God. We would lay our hearts down. Whatever it is that we walked in here, God, that we're holding on to. God, whether it's finances, family, just daily stress. God, we would just bring it to you laid at your feet, that everything in our lives, everything in our, in our minds would be cast on you. 
God, we would worship you in this moment. We would give you our all. God, for you are worthy. can have a seat if you would check out this video.
So awesome. So as you uh, can see, um, we are going to Guatemala. So we're excited. Uh, I want to thank you guys again for um, letting me be here. So I've been a worship pastor, a worship leader over, I don't know, I've been doing worship ministry since the last 12, 13 years, give or take. Um, and uh, that was God's calling on my life for a season. And um, about a year ago, God decided that that calling for me and my family was going to change. And um, against my wants and needs. Uh, I wanted to stay where we were. We're happy, we're comfortable, but um, when you're living a lifestyle of trying to always say yes to whatever God is calling you to and taking that step every time he presses on your heart, um, you have to start asking, all right, God, what are you doing? Um, And that's what we did a year ago. Uh, We sat down. I think the first time I told my wife, I think God's about to move in our lives, possibly something in missions. I think she laughed at me, um, and she was like, no, not with our little kids. Uh, and so, um, but over the course of uh, getting quiet about it, praying, uh, reading scripture and stuff, it, it just, he just did a work in our hearts, and, um, and he made it very clear uh, what God's calling was uh, going to be, and that was for us to be in Central America. And over time, he clarified where and uh, when and all that. So uh, we are leaving uh, to go onto the mission field um, uh, March 22nd, so about 36 days from now. Uh, and we are in a season of support raising. Now, when people usually hear that, they're like, oh, great, he showed up just for wanting money. Absolutely not. Um, yes, that's a huge help, but uh, realistically, anything God, that, uh, anything God is trying to uh, do, the enemy is trying to stop. And so uh, no matter what God is moving in the place, he'll, he, he has no victory over it, but he wants to hit and beat you down um, any chance he can. And so one of the biggest things for us is just having people praying for us. That is number one. Um, and those are, those are really needs, knowing that you have an army of uh, believers behind you praying uh, that the mission would continue to go forward, that lives would still be reached for the gospel, um, and that uh, and it just it gives us this peace. Um, somebody asked me the other day, aren't you terrified for taking a two-year-old and a four-year-old into a Central American country uh, where everyone's leaving there to come here? And I'm like, I don't know. I have this unbelievable calmness. Uh, that is over my uh, heart. And so, um, and that's because we have so many people right now praying for us. Um, so that's one way, but yes, there is another way. Um, you can do uh, connect with us, and that's uh, financially or physically coming and seeing us and coming and being a part of a missions trip uh, down there. We are planning to go down there for years to come. We don't really have a return date. Uh, we're planning to be there until God tells us to change plans or to um, come home. Uh, that's just, it's, it's his calling, his timing. We're not going to ask questions when that ends. I don't know that. We don't have a plan for it to end. Um, but there are ways. Um, and uh, we're raising monthly support right now from like $5 to $200 a month. Those little things like that, you think, man, well, what, what would $5 a month do? A lot. You have no idea how far dollars can go down there. And so um, one of the things I just wanted to I appreciate the opportunity this morning to just be able to say, hey, if you're interested, uh, we, we believe, me and my wife strongly believe this, that God places the right people in our lives uh, that are going to be a part of our ministry. Um, and it's the people that... Um, you know, that have that, that pull. Uh, this isn't a guilt thing. If God's not pulling your heart to give, don't. Uh, that's not what we're asking. We believe if God is working in someone's heart, uh, we believe then that's when um, the obedience of following his, his, um, his calling for you to take that step. But outside of that, love and prayer and support, uh, emotional support, um, or even physical support one day. Um, we'll go put you to work digging uh, uh, bathrooms out in the middle of a uh, volcanic land and uh and in the middle of nowhere uh where the closest hospital is two and a half hours away and we'll, we'll get you on the ground and dig so uh but no we we have fun down there and we're thankful that god is opening up this opportunity to church plant uh we work with kids ministries down there we do home uh, uh vbs's we go do home visits uh and we also um uh, make sure that the families in the homes are safe as well from um any type of sexual assaults and stuff like that what's happens and so we go and make sure that the children are taken care of and that the families have a way to make sure income is coming in but we believe in generational change uh, we believe if I can impact this child now in 10 years there's less hands needed in this village because they're going to grow up believing the gospel and then they're going to help become our local missionaries working in their communities around us so we strongly believe in generational change um, while still working with the parents as well. Uh, but that's what we do. Uh, anything we do, construction, you name it, we do it, our hands in it. Church planning, we just planted two churches um, the last since 
about four or five months ago, we've got our second church plant going and, and our second village we're in, and we're hoping to have one more church plant, uh, three, uh, by the uh, middle of summer, give or take. And so we love if you want to be a part of it. We're going to be in the back before you um, uh, leave. If you want to just come and say hello, we have a little connection card. You can get your, give us your email or address. We send out newsletters, or you can take a magnet um, just to put on your refrigerator to pray for us, um, or a business card if you want to get on social media and follow us. Um, and we can talk about that more. But thank you guys this morning for letting me lead you know, worship, be a part of that worship with you this morning. Um, and we appreciate the opportunity of being here. So turn it over to Phil. How y'all doing today? Woo! We're live. Okay. Um, I'm Phil, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship Eastside, and uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to put fellow servants of Christ uh, in front of our body and, and to introduce you to, to what God is doing in the lives of so many people, to call them out, to, to do things to advance the, the fame of Jesus around the world. And so it's an honor to have the Seas Mats with us this morning, and I do hope you'll grab some time with them afterwards, connect with them. Uh, we've, we've been blessed by knowing them uh, off and on throughout the years, and so it's, it's just a joy to kind of have, have them with us and sharing with us this morning. Um, we are in Luke chapter 11, and we're looking at what's, what's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer, probably better known as the Disciples' Prayer, because Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray, us as disciples as well. And if you've been with us for a while, we actually, a year ago, we were going through some stuff at the, the beginning of the new year and talking about different, thing, different passages that kind of shape our affections toward God. And as, as we were thinking about that, one of the passages dealt with uh, the Lord's Prayer from the book of Matthew. And um, so, so there was part of me that came to this passage and said, well, you know, maybe we should just skip this because we covered this a year ago. And then I realized two things. One, I realized that, well, Luke's variation on it is, is a little different. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but then I realized, you know what? I'm pretty sure prayer is one of those topics we can't really talk about too much, right? <laughs> that, that's, that's one of those things we kind of have to keep coming back to. And so I was like, all right, let's, let's do it again, Lord. Let's, let's go back to Luke and talk, uh, talk about prayer prayer. And uh, so, as, as you look at this passage, uh, let's, let's read it together. Um, I'll read it, and starting Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, He was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. He said to him, Whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also uh, forgive everyone in debt to us, and do not bring us into temptation. He also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine is on a journey and has come to me, and I don't have anything to offer him. Then he will answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door's already locked, and my children have gone to bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who receives and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. What father among you, as his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks an egg, will give him a scorpion? Uh, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Um, as, as we think about this passage, again, you probably have maybe heard the Lord's Prayer, or maybe some of you have memorized the Lord's Prayer, and it, and it sounds a little different in this passage. Um, and what's interesting to me is something that we've mentioned before, is that each of these gospel writers is writing down some very specific encounters with Jesus. And, and so, Jesus, as an itinerant preacher, probably would have taught the same stuff 
uh, in, in different locations, different times, and, and repeated some of the same teaching in different places. So what we're getting is maybe a, per, a particular, particular situation uh, where Jesus was talking about prayer with a disciple. Um, so that's one reason for the difference. And the second reason is that the gospel writers tend to summarize things down. We talked about this, uh, especially when it comes to uh, things like the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. It takes you about 15 minutes to read this. I don't think Jesus just got up and gave the Sermon on the Mount in 15 minutes and then got back down and that was it. Uh, my, my sense of it is this was part of a much longer talk that Jesus gave. And so that all gets summarized down into our Sermon on the Mount. And, and, and my point in saying that is that the Holy Spirit, in conjunction with Dr. Luke, is giving us exactly what we need to know at this point in the story He's giving us exactly what we need to know for our walk with God and for the life of the church. He's giving us this very, very particularized account and very, uh, very targeted uh, talk on prayer that we need to have at this point in our journey through Luke and at this point in our lives today. And so what we're going to see from this passage, I want to kind of flip this on its head because we probably have heard this prayer so much that we, also, we almost have to see it in negative contrast to understand why it is uh, that, that we need this passage. And so, I'm going to flip it on its head and talk about eight reasons why we don't pray. And I know it's, it's got to be scary when a preacher gets up and has more than, I don't know, three or four points, but I promise I'll move quick, try to keep it fun, and, and we'll, we'll move through these. Uh, so, first, first reason why we don't pray is because we've never been taught to pray. I, I love how this starts. It starts with these disciples coming to Jesus, and they, they've been watching Him pray. They've been seeing Him do that day in and day out, and then they come to Him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. I mean, what, what was it about these guys that motivated them to come to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to pray? I, mean, I, I think about, I can, I can just imagine, what, what would it have been like to be with Jesus as he prioritized prayer, just constantly, constantly, getting away to pray, praying among his disciples, praying among the crowds, like constant prayer it was, was a priority of Jesus' life. And, and when Jesus prayed, when you read these prayers, like in John chapter 17, you just read these things that are like, it, it's just like natural communication with God the Father. It's incredible. We see Jesus praying and things change. Lazarus comes up from the dead. Like Jesus' prayers do stuff. We see Jesus wrestling in prayer in the garden and sweating blood. I mean, to, to observe that as a disciple, you've got to be saying, I, I want to pray like that. I want to pray like that. And then that pushes me to, to question, I mean, what, I think what we want to be doing in the church is creating a culture where people are seeing prayer done rightly and are compelled to go pray more themselves, to take prayer more seriously. I think that, that was one of the helpful things prayer. Uh, uh, Toby read a prayer from a Puritan last week, and, you know, it's, it's one of those kind of high and lofty things, but it, it helps us kind of think more about what could prayer look like. We try to model that well. Um, even last summer, we, we were getting together and doing some prayer meetings throughout the summer in our small groups. I hope you all are praying together over needs and challenges as, as they come up. Uh, we want ourselves to be surrounded by prayers so that our prayers uh, may be stronger. And so, that's, that's what we're doing intentionally in the life of the church. I think of um, this as uh, through, the, through the eyes of a young man, uh, 12 years old, I was in a church, and, and there, was a, uh, there was a guy that would sit in the back, run the sound system and things like that. His name was Mr. Dave, and I've probably talked about him before. He was a huge impact in my life. And so here I am, this 12-year-old kid, and here's this um, you know, 40-some-year-old guy who's uh, retired from the post office and injured himself, had polio as a kid. He was like one of the last kids in the U.S. to ever have polio. And, and uh, you know, just, just, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't, he wasn't as mobile as, as the rest of us, so he kind of had to hang out there in the back. And so, a couple of us young guys would go back there and would pray with him on Wednesday nights. And 
you know, in, in my heart as a, as this twelve year old kid, I thought, man, you know, I'm I'm being really nice and helping this guy out, you know, be, you know, praying with him, making sure he's not alone during during this prayer meeting. Um, fast forward to when I was seventeen and leaving Maryland, um, I, I I realized that the situation was totally the reverse. Uh, that I was learning more praying with Mr. Dave than I had learned in any Sunday school class under any sermon because, because this guy, I, I kid you not, uh, his, he would start up praying and the whole room would get startled because, <laughs> because he would pray in this bellowing voice that would just fill the room. Um, and and he, would, he could start with prayer almost like he was just picking up a conversation just where he had left off with God maybe minutes before and just, just rolled right into prayer. He would, he would pray and he would, he would quote scripture. He would, he would argue with God sometimes over things. He, would, he, he had this list of missionaries, all the ones that we knew and then a whole bunch that we didn't know, and he knew exactly how to pray for each one of them because he was taking time throughout the week to write them, and this was in the days before email. And, and so he was writing them. He was getting their prayer requests. He was uh, mailing them books and things, in the, uh, things to encourage them along the way. And, and he would be doing this, and, and that would flow out in his prayer. He would pray for the needs of the church. He knew everybody's needs. He, he knew all the shut-in ladies and, and, and would check in on them throughout the week. He, he would pray for the pastor. He would, and then, of course, he would always end by praying for his buddies that were there with him that evening. And we would, we would some, he would sometimes go until most everybody had left the room. But it was the most amazing thing. And in those experiences, God taught me how to pray. God shaped my understanding of what prayer could really be because somebody was there to teach me to pray. And so that has two prongs, doesn't it? If you pray and take prayer seriously, who are you teaching to pray? And if prayer is a struggle for you, which I think for most of us it is, who are you surrounding yourself with that's giving you a greater vision for what prayer could be? Who is, who is in your life to teach you to pray? We all need to learn how to pray, but that's the main reason why we don't pray. We've never had those kinds of experiences. We've never placed ourselves in a position where we're surrounding our, ourselves by people who put a high value on prayer. So that's reason number one why we don't pray. Reason number two is uh, because we see it uh, as unnatural. <clears throat> in, in verse two, it says, um, whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Whenever. Uh, this, this when becomes an if for so, much, so many of us, doesn't it? Jesus says, you know, when you pray, pray like this. But, but for us, that, that becomes an if you pray, pray like this, right? We, we make the, we turn prayer into this optional thing that, you know, if, if I get around to it, if I have the time for it, if, if I can schedule that into my calendar, then I'll pray in a, in a way that's very serious. But Jesus says, when you pray, this, his assumption is that you are praying, that you're going about life and, and walking with God in a way that is pouring out in prayer. It's like fish that swim. It's like, people that breathe. It's, it's built into the natural part of who we are. We've talked about this before, that, that human beings are one of these you know, very unique sort of creatures and that we communicate. We don't just grunt at each other. Uh, and, and why are we built to communicate? Because the communicating God made us. He made us to communicate with Him ultimately. Our, our greatest purpose is to glorify Him through communicating with Him, communicating in prayer. Uh, I think of it as the oxygen that fills the lungs uh, of the soul. I, th I, was, I saw a video recently of these military aviators that were in training, and as part of their training, they would uh, put them in this fake airplane, and they would tip it upside down into a pool. And one of the one of the trainees, she went to grab her scuba thing and stick the regulator in her mouth, and she goes to suck in air, and nothing comes in because the tank had been shut off. She had, she had accidentally not turned on her tank. So thankfully, the, the dive instructors there were able to quickly 
get her up to the surface and get her breathing again. But my goodness, what a scary feeling that must have been when suddenly what was supposed to be a very normal thing, breathing, becomes impossible. And in a similar way, I think with prayer, we make the thing that should be natural, breathing, praying, pouring out our hearts to God, our Father, become the unnatural thing. Oh, I've got I've to force it. I've got to work at it. It's, it's got to be, it, it's almost like thinking about when you inhale and when you exhale. It's, it's like obsessing about those levels of details, whereas for a believer, as one who's been changed by Christ, it should be a normal part of life in our prayers. So, reframing how we think about prayer is vastly, vastly important. The third reason why we don't pray is that we really don't believe in the goodness of God. Um, I, notice the first word of the prayer. Jesus says, Father, Father. And he, and he circles back to this at the end in verses 9 through 12, and he gives this example of, you know, when, when you come to your dad and you ask something of him, is he, is he really going to give you something awful? Is he going to give you snakes and scorpions when you're asking for food to eat? Like, no, he's not going to do that. But for some reason, we have in our heads that our God is not good. And, and let me explain. If, if, I have, if I'm confronted with the option of, is God great? Can he do all things? Is he all-powerful? Is he... Uh, omnipotent, we use that theological language, um, or uh, is, is he caring toward me? Does he really love me? The, the gentleness, the, 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 the goodness of God. I will always disregard the goodness of God and uphold the greatness of God. That's the default of our hearts, because it's easy for us to assume God is, good, is great and powerful and up there and able to do all kinds of things, but is He, in His heart of hearts, compassionate toward me? Does He really care about my situation? Does He really care about the distress that I'm going through? Yeah, He may, he may be able to do something, but does He really want to do something for me? And this is why, why Jesus orients us towards Father and his care to give good gifts to us. I, I'll tell you, even from my heart, this is, this is where my heart is tempted. Uh, I think back of in 2014, just a whole series of events just kind of collapsed in on our family, and we were just dealing with a lot of stuff with our oldest child and, and navigating some, some challenges that were you know, very stressing physically, mentally, spiritually, all, all of the things just kind of pressing in on us. And, and there were these very dark times during that period where I was going, I know that God exists. I know that He's all-powerful. I know He's capable of just snapping His finger in, in a second and dealing with this. But does He really care? Does he care about my situation? Does he care about my three-year-old daughter? Why doesn't he care? And that, that became something that was kind of this dark hole, this, this pit that uh, sometimes just looms in the background and, and sometimes isn't that far away. But, but it takes recognizing that and recognizing that default in our hearts to shift over to saying, I question God's goodness when he doesn't answer the way I think he should. Yes, I know he can, but does his heart really care? One of the deepest, darkest reasons why we don't really pray is because we distrust the heart of God for us. And that's why he starts with Father, because we don't really believe in the goodness of God. So the, the fourth thing is that we don't really pray because we hide from the holiness of God. He says, your name be honored as holy, or hallowed be your name, this holiness of God. Um, 
I don't know about you. Have, have you ever found yourself in this situation where you know you should be praying, but you feel like you probably can't or shouldn't or need to kind of do some things right before you can go and pray? Like you've got to clean up the act a little bit, and then I'll go and pray and read my Bible and, you know, do the things that I'm supposed to do. And, and, and I don't know, it, it was... Um, it was interesting just uh, as growing up in a very traditional church background, uh, there was that sense where you dressing up for church was kind of this, this thing that we did in order to kind of, um, it, it certainly wasn't for other people. It was, it was this kind of thing where like, I, I've got to like make God happy with me, so I'm going to do these things, you know, externally. And, and so once I have kind of cleaned myself up, then God will be happy and smile down at me and that, that kind of thing. And that was kind of the mentality that I had, mistakenly, as a, as a child. Um, and, and in so many ways, prayer often becomes that performative ritual before God of like, I will get myself ready, I'll have all the right words, and then I'll pray all the right things, and then God's going to be happy with me, and God will accept my prayers then. And, and that is so contradictory to what the Bible actually tells us about prayer. I think of uh, Hebrews uh, talks about this, this idea of Hebrews 4.16 says that, that prayer is coming boldly before the throne of grace coming boldly before the throne of grace. The, the throne of grace is, yes, it's a throne. It's, it's where the king belongs. Um, it's, it's where our king is holy and high and lifted up, and the, the angels sing to him as, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And, and yes, we don't deserve to be there, but it's not just a throne. It's a throne of grace. It's a, it's, a, it's a throne of welcome, open arms for those of us who are in Christ. We don't, we don't have to polish ourselves up to come before the king, to come into his throne room. It's a place of mercy. It's a place for the needy. So when you find yourself in, in despair, when you find yourself in sin, when you find yourself feeling trapped and unable to look yourself in the mirror, come. Because that is what prayer is meant for. That is who prayer is meant for, is those who feel dirty, those who feel unclean, those who feel unrighteous, because they come before not, not a throne of works, but a throne of grace. You come before a throne of grace. And it's in those moments where I need prayer the most. I need the connection with God and to talk with Him and get serious about what's going on in my life that Satan sees as an opportunity to push me away and say, you're not clean enough. You haven't done enough. You haven't been good enough this week. Hold off. Wait. And it's in those moments that I must prioritize prayer. But I don't because I want to hide in front of the holiness of God. Don't, don't run from Him. Run to Him in those moments. Fifth reason is because we are safe and satisfied. He says, verse 2, your kingdom come... Verse 3, give us each day our daily bread. You know, if, if uh, political gamesmanship, self-assertion can get us everything we need in this world, then we'll never pray, your kingdom come. If uh, exerting yourself at work, hard work, and a lot of self-effort can get you everything you need in life, you'll never pray, give us each day our daily bread. The American idols are peace and prosperity, safety and satisfaction, and those idols are constantly under threat from world events, catastrophe, politicians, neighbors, anyone can threaten those idols. I, mean, I think of even just the unsettledness about what's going on in Ukraine these days and just what, what's going to happen? Is that going to tank all the global markets? What's going to happen to the value of my dollar? And we get fr afraid and nervous and anxious about those things. But, but God wants us to be in a posture where we have to say, Lord, I... I can't do this on my own. I don't have the safety, security, stability that I, actually, that I think I have. It's all illusory. It's all, it's, it's, it's all a phantom of my imagination. Uh, I, when, when we pursue peace and prosperity at any cost, eventually they're going, there's going to come a day where you turn around and say, I just, I don't pray the way I should. I, I think of this, this guy I, I knew that was, he had gone from a uh, full-time salary position. He was, he was making six figures and all this, and he quit, and we became uh, reliant on 
uh, commissions uh, as an income. And he told me, he said, Phil, I have not prayed this way in, before in my whole life because suddenly I can't just bank on the fact that, that the automatic draft is going to come through and that I've got money in the account. I actually have to, to, to see the Lord provide and answer those prayers uh, in, in some miraculous ways. Uh, I was thinking even what uh, Michael was sharing with me this morning, how God has provided for him on this path toward missions. And it's, it's like, you know, when you're placed in this spot where you're actually having to depend on God rather than to say, I can achieve the kingdom. I can store up my yearly bread and I'll be just fine. S- somehow we're forced into this posture of dependence. So uh, we don't pray because we feel like we're self-satisfied. Sixth reason is because we are comfortable in our sin. This connects back to kind of that holiness of God aspect. Um, He says, verse 4, and forgive us our sins, uh, at the end of verse 4, and do not bring us into temptation. True prayer always involves confession, repentance, a prayer for holiness, that God would change our hearts, that God would make our our, uh, outside actions match what He sees deep down inside of us, that what Jesus has done inside our hearts would be visible in our lives, in our actions. And to earnestly pray for that, we have to actually earnestly not want the things that God doesn't want in our lives. We have to be able to reject and push away from the sin that is so close to us. Uh, We have to be able to pray sincerely that God would deliver us from materialistic cravings, from sexual temptation, from desire for power, But the fact is, we're too in love with those things to be able to earnestly pray to forgive us of our sins, to not lead us into temptation, because honestly, we kind of want the temptation deep down. So do you want to be delivered from sin? Do you want to see His power shining through your life? We have to want that in order to ask for that, right? And so maybe as as you're thinking about uh, you know, I need, to, I need to really think about prayer and, and how I talk with God throughout the week. Maybe, maybe a first step would just be to say, God, help me to see my sin the way you see it, the way you see it that sent your son all the way to the cross to deal with it kind of way, that, that I may hate it the way you hate it so that I may love you more fully. May God change our hearts and the way we see sin so that we may pray the way we need to. The seventh reason why we don't pray is because we enjoy hoarding up the hurts in life. He says, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us. So just the assumption, God, forgive us, because this is what we're doing with others. (laughs) We're forgiving them all the time, (laughs) right? Right? Uh, 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 I don't know about you, but th- that, one's, that one's a hard one because, because what we ask for God so, so frequently, we're not willing to extend to others. We want God to be gracious and forgiving of us. I have heard the, the phrase, one, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Um, you know, some, sometimes people take that a little too far. I think of this one guy I knew who would hoard everything. Uh, he, would, he would find stuff by the, the road, he would find stuff in dumpsters, he would find stuff around, and, and he would bring it to his, his place, and he would collect all this stuff. And eventually, it, it became so much that it filled up the rental house he used to be able to rent out and make money. Um, no worries, though. Eventually, he filled up his own house and had to move out of that and moved into this trailer out in the middle of nowhere um, because he just kept collecting stuff. I mean, he had stacks of cardboard that he would use for composting. He had uh, mounds of, of pipe fittings and plumbing stuff for, you know, I don't know, whenever you have like one of those plumbing emergencies where you've got to re, re-plumb your entire house, um, or, or, or these big buckets of lead weights uh, for, I don't know, whatever you use those. They, they would come off the tires of cars and stuff, and you just find them and collect them. So, I don't know, maybe he was trying to supply an army or something. But um, he, he had all this stuff that he had collected and, and hoarded other people's trash had become his treasure so much that he didn't even have room to live, to move, to do anything. And I think so, much, so many times we have the same posture toward the hurts 
of others, the, the things that people have done to us, um, the hurts, the slights, the little frustrations, and we just kind of hoard those things up and we collect them up so much so that we can't even live, we can't even move around in life without these things causing friction with others. Um, when your life is full of bitterness over relationships gone sideways, when you're constantly in need of another enemy in life uh, to, to go after, uh, things got resolved or that person's now out of your life, who's the next target for my frustration? Um, or I, I think about it in, in the context of, um, you know, we don't, we don't talk about Bruno. Um, so, so many of us have these Brunos in our lives that we just don't talk about anymore, and they're just kind of non-entities. Um, collections of non-entities are not a good thing because it reveals a heart that treasures up and hoards the hurts rather than letting them go at the foot of the cross. What Jesus is saying here is this. If, if you treasure up the wrongdoings of others, you'll never, ever, ever treasure the, what one did to remove the wrongdoings that you have between you and God. If you store up the sins of others, you'll never discover the freedom of running to the one who refuses to look on your sins any longer. The last reason why we don't pray is we we don't pray, and this, this one was one that just kind of caught me off guard. I was reading this section right after, is we don't pray because we're ashamed and embarrassed. We don't pray because we're ashamed and embarrassed. Um, some of you struggle in prayer because you've, in your mind, you've done the thing. I've, I've prayed about this situation, and I didn't get the thing, and so why bother doing that anymore? In other words, we, we get to this place in our logic where we say, um, it is better uh, to, to avoid not asking and not getting than to try to ask and not get. I know it's not going to happen, so why bother? And so we've gotten to this point where we've rationalized this embarrassment, this, this uh, shame that we have when we come before God, and we've rationalized it to the point where we just say, I, you know, I just shouldn't shouldn't bother going before God. It's, it's this story of this, this guy who comes to a friend's house and say, hey, you know, I, I need this loaf of bread. Otherwise, you know, it, it's going to look bad on me. I, I need you to get up. I need you to help me out. And the friend gets up and helps him out because this guy is just brazen in his, you know, uh, his, his, his statements here. He's just brazen and saying, like, I, this is going to look bad on me. I, just, I need you to deliver me. I need you to help. And he just boldly puts all of it out there on the table. And the guy says, oh, okay, when you, since you put it all out on the table like that, I guess I have to come through. I have to help you out. Uh, I, I think that this, I, I, I've encountered that same thing so many times with my kids, uh, the, the dude in the story where, where it's, you know, someone's up at midnight asking for a snack or a drink or, a, you know, whatever it is, and, and there's part of me that, that reacts with, oh, here we go again, but ultimately, I'm going to help. But what, what do I hate worse? Um, what, what really frustrates me is, is the moments when, um, I don't know, it's something simple that breaks that I could easily fix or something that they want to put on that's not going on the way they think it should go on, or something that they want to reach that they can't reach, but I can easily reach for them. And, and suddenly, without any words, without any explanation, they run off to the other room, either in, in rage or pouting in some corner somewhere because, of, uh, because the thing uh, wasn't delivered to them, uh, and because I, I didn't uh, or they weren't able to do it themselves. And, and I, I think it, in so many ways that that's a parallel to this scenario. Um, we, we avoid coming to God because we're embarrassed about our own deficiency, our own lack. In this, in this story, this guy doesn't have bread to give his friend who's traveling. And so we're, we're embarrassed that we have a deficiency here. And so we don't really say what we need, and we don't really want to be in that awkward spot of God not coming through for us again. So we just don't, we just don't say it. We, we would rather just storm off. We would rather sulk in a corner than to ask and not get what we think we should get. We ghost God because we're afraid, up, afraid to come up empty-handed. And so in, in this sense, we, 
We need to renew our boldness. That, I love the, the description here. He, he answers, yet yeah, because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. When we're willing to just lay it all on the table and be honest before God about the struggles of our hearts, be, be honest about the fact that we, we feel discouraged or even disappointed in prayer and, and, and where we're at spiritually as we're wrestling in prayer, God will honor that. God will respond as, as we put it all on the table before Him. Instead of being ashamed and embarrassed and hiding, be truthful. Talk to God about your deepest needs this week. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would give us in this church prayer warriors that set a tone of prayer for us, that we would be a congregation that teaches each other to pray. I pray that you would help us uh, to see that we need prayer to feed our souls, to oxygenate our hearts before you. I pray that you would show us your goodness in those moments when we're prone to doubt it. I pray that you would draw us closer when we feel just completely unworthy to come into your presence in prayer. I pray that you would shake up our status quo, our sense of safety, security, stability, so that we may cry out for our daily bread and for your kingdom to come and to make all that's wrong come untrue. I pray that you would shake us from our carelessness about sin, that you would release our clenched fists around the hearts of others in our lives, and that you would grant us shameless boldness to come before you, knowing that you are our good Father, that you want to give us the Spirit. You want to give us all good things, that we may come before you and plead the grace of Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. If you would, let's stand and continue to worship this morning. Trust. 
trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. And we trust you. And all things we trust you. And your ways are higher than our own. Because we trust. And we trust you. And Jesus, we trust you. Because your ways are higher than our own. This we know. We will see the enemy run. This we know. We will see the victory come. We hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfair. Michael, you guys can be seated for a moment. Just kind of wanted to reiterate, you know, I was really convicted of what Phil was mentioning a moment. So it's really easy for us to to believe and remember that God created all things. He holds everything together. You know, he's sovereign over everything. But it is often difficult to think on, you know, do I really believe that God, you know, for those who love God, he's working all things together for our good and for his glory. And so just a good reminder this morning that God does, you know, he does desire for that relationship to communicate with him and to be with him. And he, and he cares what's going on. And so I just want to encourage you in that, that God, yeah, God is sovereign over all things, but he desires to work all things together for our good and for his glory to make much of him. And so I want to encourage us in that. And as you go out this week, we have a couple things from an announcement standpoint. Just want to encourage you, you know, we have small groups Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. There's some some new cards back there. We we added some contact information so that, hey, if you're checking out a new group or you're thinking, hey, may, can't do Monday, may go to Tuesday um, this week, we, we want to encourage you in that. But just a way for you to check in because also we want to encourage our small groups to to go do stuff together. And so, you know, maybe you're going to do a meal together tomorrow and or maybe go out this week. Hey, let's all just kind of sync up fifth fifth week and let's go out to eat. So things like that that I know some groups have already done. And so we want to encourage that connection point. Um, and also for those who've been with us for a while and Hey, you're kicking the tires on this church plant thing and want to be a part of what we're doing. We're going to do a connections, a, a prospective members class on the 27th. I want to encourage you on February 27th, that Sunday, to join us. We're going to have lunch. It's going to be provided. We want to encourage you to hear, to come and listen to Toby, Phil, and myself, kind of give a little bit of the background of how we got started, why we're here, uh, what we're trying to do, what God's called us to do on the east side. And then um, we also have uh, the marriage retreat. There was a slide that was rolling through earlier today. We want to encourage you, those that um, want to be a part of that, our sending church and the network together, uh, Christ Fellowship Network, is going to do a marriage retreat. Um, I believe it's April 1st. Was it first and 2nd? I'm saying that right. Um, but we want to encourage you in that if, you're, if you've not signed up. I think there's still an opportunity to sign up. We have, I think there's a handful of rooms remaining, Toby. Is that right? About Okay, so you have some time, to, we think. So, hey, we'll make it happen. If you're interested in going, it will be a good thing. And so we'll make it happen if you're interested in going. But I want to encourage you this week again. Let's, let's get on our knees before the Lord. Let's pray together. Let's pray and make much of Jesus. And as you go out this week, I want to encourage you. The gospel goes with you. Make much of Jesus.